Hello everybody, I am Raphael Perry and tonight I'd like to play some more Pathfinder Kingmaker Adventure Path, the computer game version. Now, unfortunately, I played this last night and I recorded it and the recording was corrupted and unplayable. So here I am recording this episode for the second time. Fortunately, I noticed the error message and checked the recording before going to save the game. So I didn't save over the old save and I'm exactly back where I was. At the feast that is being held in my honour for defeating the Stag Lord. Now last night, prior to beginning, I went and skimmed through the last 12 minutes of the previous episode because it had been some weeks since I'd gained the important briefing on people to look out for at this banquet and things I might need to know about them. Yeah, it turns out it was actually a lot simpler than I expected and there was just one person I really needed to look out for. That being said, maybe it's a good thing that I'm getting a second chance to record this episode because I did voice some rather strongly worded opinions on certain Paizo authors and Paizo in general and their strong anti-monarchist, anti-royalist, anti-traditional stance which the player character in this case is almost forced into as if there are no other options or the other more traditional options are considered to be unappealing or ineffective and so on. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I'll get angry about that again, but I was quite incensed at how blatantly partisan it was in a few points. I mean, it's not just this adventure path I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about Paizo products in general. There's only about one country in their world that has a proper monarchy, and that would be Taldor. And they just shat all over that in a recent adventure path. They're like, oh no, Taldor's rubbish, we don't care, we love Andoran, because Andoran's shit. And basically Signar from Relative Press's Iron Kingdoms, but without the robots. Right, so anyway, here we are in a lovely great big, and I'm not just talking about the artwork where they blatantly put the Signaran crest on Andoran's, I'm talking about their society as well. Andoran is basically American Revolution, just after the revolution sort of thing. Right, so we are here at a lovely big feast and I have paused just to avoid the passing of time too much. Also, we have been forced to travel about 50 miles here without resting. We haven't become any more knackered but we are fatigued so we might as well straighten up our clothes, make sure our armour is comfortably fitting and alleviate that fatigue as we're otherwise unlikely to get a good chance to rest anytime soon. Now since I have gone and spoken to everyone here, our companions, who we have adventured with, have like single lines of dialogue and no real conversation to have. There are about four or five people here I should speak with, so apart from that everyone else is just nameless guests, you know, or guards. Let's go speak to this lander fellow. A handsome, well-dressed young man of about 17 years old looks at you with a polite smile. 17 years old. That hair is not albino hair. That is blatantly grey hair turning white. Which probably doesn't belong on a 17 year old. Either the artist really has got a thing for trying to make the hair grey and not too white or I mean you wouldn't believe the shit he's seen right <laughs> so you're the famous slayer of the stag lord's gang soon to be a baron pleased to make your acquaintance my name is Lander just Lander? No last name, no title? Well, let's just say I'm here incognito. Under my circumstances, it's wise to keep one's lineage to oneself. If that's so, he has blatantly just blown his cover. 
Truth be told, that's precisely why I, what I wanted to speak with you about. You see, I'm an heir to one of Bravois' noble houses. I won't say which, but believe me, a newly appointed baron with no connections would do well to have a friend like me. I travel the country in secret without servants, so I can see it for myself. Not from a carriage window, but face to face with the people. My family would never approve, of course, but then I never asked. I need to know Bravoy if I am going to rule a part of it some day. Well, he won't be travelling the country in secret for long if he keeps telling people about it. I know Germandi wants to impose her stepson on you as an emissary of Bravoy. Refuse. Take me instead. Don't look at my age. While they may have trained this half-orc to swing a sword, I've been training to rule since I was a child. I'll be of far greater use to you, both now and in the future, after I have a firm position in my family. Okay, there's a few possibilities here. If we take him in under our wing and take him back to our barony, He could be hoping to betray us and usurp our position and take it over for himself, believing that he has little chance of inheriting something big from his family, or to add it to his family's territory. Secondly, he could really be a black sheep of a family, you know, who has aspirations, wants to be the power behind the throne, but doesn't really like to do things in a traditional way. You know, he doesn't want the res actual responsibility or the accountability if he slips up. Now, here's a problem. He doesn't like staying in the noble mansions. He likes going out, mingling with the people all the time. If I appoint him to a position in my court, how do I know he's even going to turn up to do his job? Most of the time he'll just be buggering off, hobnobbing with the uh, hoi polloi. Well, no, rather the, the ruffians and ragamuffins. Essentially, he will be unreliable. Yes, it would be good if Arnish play a very secret service kind of game, except he's blatantly not blending into the crowd here at all with that grey hair. He should put a hood over it or something. Um, I don't feel I can rely on him. I may be able to trust him, but I don't feel I can rely upon him. Okay, so are you then from the Rostovic nobility? Oh no, I'm not from here. I'm just visiting, you could say. I wanted to see for myself the heroes who managed to conquer the frontier lands and the Lord Mayor was kind enough to invite me to this wonderful party. Well, I will consider your proposal and probably ignore it. Yes, do so and carefully. So, he's a bit of an interloper and upstart. He wants to work his way in. Oh, yeah, that reminds me of other things. We have characters who are supposed to level now. So let's do that before we forget. So, Jephile, she's an inquisitor of Urgafoa, the goddess of the undead. There's also a god of the undead, I know, or a second goddess of the undead. They're different kinds of undead, okay? Um, she's also a goddess of famine, plague, pestilence. Um, okay, so... Cunning initiative adds her wisdom modifier to initiative checks. Alright. And her wisdom modifier would be plus three. Okay. Five skill points. As an inquisitor, she needs all knowledge skills. Bit of perception and this what would be used for sense motive um not sure but we'll go for a perception for now uh new spells bane bless cause fit so she's going a bit heavy on the necromancy because she is undead um got divine favor and inf she's all obviously yeah 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 right um Shield of Faith could be good. Stunning Barrier. Um, 
plus one to exceed. Uh, yeah. um, Stalling Barrier could be a good one, actually. Uh, but she is a 6 level caster, not a 9 level caster. I'm honestly thinking Bane might just be worth it. However, um, Haze of Dreams is a deity specific spell, isn't it? That's. Uh, no. Of course, Fear might be good. I think. Um, it's between Protection from Alignment and Stunning Barrier. Also, Stunning Barrier, it'll be different. Okay. And then she gets to level again, apparently. So, solo tactics and teamwork feat. Teamwork feats, you need to have someone else with the teamwork feat, alright? To gain the benefits from it under certain specific situations. And solo tactics allows an Inquisitor to pretend all the other heroes in the party have all the same teamwork feats. So essentially, I don't need to worry about other people having the teamwork feats. Right, let's get a uh, world, religion, nature, a um, bit more athletics, a little persuasion, because you never know it might come in useful. Uh, right, a feat and a teamwork feat, yes. So I'm going to take Shake It Off. Um, when you're adjacent to one or more allies who have this feat, and remember that with solo tactics, I get to pretend everyone else has the feat. So essentially the entire party does for her purposes. You gain a plus one bonus to all saving throws per such an ally, up to plus four. So basically, the more allies that surround her, the easier her saving throws will become. And for a general feat, what have we got so far? Um, we got toughness, uh, point blank shot on weapon focus. I'm not sure weapon focus is such a good idea, but it might be actually because she has that great big scythe. If I do, what would it be under? Would it be scythe? Yeah, I think it would. Um, I think, however, that Combat casting would be a good choice for her. There we go. And for a new spell, I was torn between Stunning Barrier and Protection from Alignment, so why don't I take the other one? There we go. And that should make her level 3. Which should, is now, interestingly, two levels below the rest of the party. Okay. Harim, you also have some leveling to do. Ragongar, you don't. You're a half orc, you're an evil monster, you're chaotic evil. You don't really have much of a place in our society unless you can be redeemed somehow. I mean, you're even a really shit, horrible class which shouldn't exist, so, um, yeah. Right, Harim is a cleric of. Groetus, the god of madness. Uh, so Groetus is the god of madness, the god of forgetfulness, the god of the moon. He's also literally the moon. He's also literally not the moon at the same time. He's also the god of the apocalypse and the end times. And yeah, uh, very... And uh, Harem is such a broomy. Right, so we stick cleric for now. Uh, skills. Let's up his religious knowledge. Uh, get him a little bit of persuasion. He might eventually sort of browbeat people into submission. There we go. And one more level. Uh, up that. Get him a little bit of athletics. He might actually need it. Ah, uh, what have we got so far? We got heavy armor proficiency. I kind of want to go endurance into die hard um, let's see endurance uh, yeah yeah that'll that'll get him some good uh, sleeping capability uh, however 
what else could we get? We could get extra channel. Um, is he channeling positive or negative? He is chaos domain destruction. <laughs> positive. <coughs> okay, we could get him iron will. Uh, however, that doesn't seem to fit his personality quite so much. He's, he's all doom and gloom and uh, open to surprises. Uh, shield wool would be nice if we can get lots of shield wool. Um, our Inquisitor wouldn't benefit from that unless she had shield wool herself because she doesn't get to pretend she has teamwork feats. She just gets to pretend everyone else does. Um, toughness could be good to go with his heavy armor and I think we should do that because he is a little bit lower level than everyone else. All right and is that everybody? I think that's everybody. Okay lovely. Let us continue. Ah yes here is a man by the name of Megar Vaan. This man is obviously more comfortable on the battlefield than in the company of nobles. He's well built, but the expensive waistcoat he's wearing doesn't quite fit properly as though it was borrowed. He has a few pale scars across his face and his dark hair is drawn into an unkempt ponytail with a few streaks of grey running through it. He greets you with a broad smile and a firm handshake and that is not a ponytail, that's a bun. Unless there's like a little, if that's supposed to be coming from a ponytail, but it doesn't really. Let me introduce you to myself. I'm Megar Vaan. A new ruler of Dunsward, your neighbour to the east. Like you, I'm about to be a baron. Great job of the stag lord, by the way. Not everyone could exterminate a whole gang of bandits with such a small team. And, uh, how did you earn the title of baron? Truth be told, my team and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Jamandi Aldori needed someone reliable to take and hold the territory. I'm the captain of a mercenary team, if that wasn't clear. A Varnling host. You've heard of us? No? No matter. We've done work for Jumanji before. This time the task was simple. We just waltzed into the area, cleared it of the most brazen monsters, and built a small fort to hold the place. And for that, a barony and land to own. It was a dream job. So there's some kind of organized land grab going on. I don't think the Aldori are the only people able to grant rights to land in the stolen lands. Literally the land is being stolen right now by multiple factions. Uh, how do you feel about being a nobleman? Looking at his rich clothes, Varn smirks. Like a pheasant on a plate. I've killed all kinds of monsters, but this is the first time I've felt so strongly like turning away could get me eaten. He nods towards an arrogant man in the other corner of the room. See that lad, Baron Drelov? He is not like us. Who knows what generation of Baron he is? Didn't even shake my hand. You and me were like dirt beneath his boots. That's why those like us, the newly made nobility, need to stick together. Otherwise, he'd take my hand and yours in the blink of an eye. So, this here is in character, right? It fits with him being a yuppie, essentially. But it also feels like the writer's heavy-handedly trying to shoehorn us into agreeing with him and being on his side. We also have recently been introduced into the lower ranks of the nobility. They are likely to look down upon us and consider us illegitimate, for we haven't really... Um, held our position long enough. And they are absolutely right to do so. We are upstarts. We barely deserve to be here. They do not appreciate the humility of nobility. Which is a, a rare and, and pleasant thing. <laughs> Actually, no. Most of the members of nobility that I've met, all four or five of them, maybe, maybe a few more, in my life, have been really nice humble, easygoing people. They don't boss people about or throw their weight around. They're just like, okay, yeah, you know what? Me and my family, we are responsible for a large portion of land. Like half of Oxfordshire. You know. And yes, that's a lot of responsibility and we actually do have to do stuff in the management part. It's like, yeah, okay, you know, fine. Great, uh, well, it was, it was nice meeting you. Farewell. 
Goodbye. Once you've settled in, come pay us a visit. So, we've got the yuppie who is friendly and sympathetic to our cause. We're not going to talk to Lindsay because it would involve hearing her voice. And we've got Keston Garess here. Well, Tachi Show. Well, well, scum. And, and how did he. Be, I've, maybe I've had one too many. Yes, maybe you have, old friend. Well, not that old. We met once or twice. Let's just roll gone. around here. We got Harim here, Maudlin in his cups. And then. Uh, this fellow, Hannes Drelev. This man's gorgeous clothes hide rippling muscles beneath them. He looks past your ear, obviously bored. He does a lot of physical exercise and hard work, though, apparently. Baron Hannes Trelev, he says offhandedly, emphasizing the word Baron. And you must be of a stag lord, butcher. I'm sorry, I quite forgot your name. But you took out the stag lord and his gang, and so Sword Lord Jamandi is granting you permission to take this place, right? Well, congratulations. My land's light to the west of yours. I suppose we're neighbors now. Right. Yes, I defeated the Stag Lord. Pray tell, what did you do to deserve your new dominion? A smirk appears on the Baron's face. I don't need to deserve or prove anything. Countless generations of my glorious ancestors have done so for me. If I had a slightly bigger army, Sword Lord Jamandi would have simply given all of the stolen lands to me. Alas, I don't have so many soldiers at my disposal, so she had to urgently make barons <laughs> for likes of you and Vaughn. Right. This is an unnecessarily condescending attitude for him to have. <clears throat> this again feels like some heavy-handed writing attempting to make me automatically dislike the nobility because they actually have breeding and upbringing teaching them how to govern, unlike most jumped up politicians who don't. This is really offensive to me. I do not like this. I don't mind being presented with options, right? We're like, hey, here's Here's this guy, here's that guy, here's, here's this third guy over here. You could work with any of them, right? And they each have different personalities and stuff. Thing is, they are not only stereotypes, but they come across as very blunt, heavy-handed stereotypes this early on. Maybe in time, they will grow on me, right? They'll become more three-dimensional, more developed characters. But at this point in time... Who is this bloke? Oh, he's just some snob. And he has every right to be this snobbish towards me. That doesn't mean that he should. And in fact, if he is, the remainder of the surrounding nobility will probably look down upon him for doing so. However, he may also be doing it to get their approval. Right, so, there's lots of different things here, but this is an insult to him. This was practically an insult to him, this first question. This is an insult to him, this is an insult to him, I'm not going to insult him when all three, three out of my four available options are to insult him and the fourth one is to say goodbye. That's the game developers saying, you do not like this man, you do not agree with him, you can't, you have to think the same as us. Why? I can think however I want. Well, goodbye to you. I'm sure we'll meet again. Not even deigning to reply, Baron Drelev turns around and looks away. Again, as is his right. I mean, I don't like him very much, but that doesn't mean that I should automatically hate his guts. And here we have a man who goes by the name of Ezvanki Kiig. A handsome man with a weather-beaten face grasps your hand tightly in his rough, calloused palms. Unlike the rest of the guests in this their festive clothes, he wears a simple robe. The only luxury you see upon him is a goal, is a holy symbol of Erastal made of solid gold. The other guests look at him with respect, some bordering on awe. 
So Arastal is the god of the home and the hearth, of household traditions, of good husbandry, farming. Yeah, good husbandry as in looking after the animals and running the farm well, of hunting, you know, of basically keeping society together out in the wilderness, in the frontiers. It would make total sense in the Stolen Lands. We already have a priest of Arastal there. Congratul- oh, deep voice. Congratulations on your victory, he says in a deep voice. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Esvanki Kig, High Priest of Erastel in Restov. I'm sorry, Erastel worshippers always come across as really Welsh. <laughs> it's, it's not just for longbows, okay? Uh. Ooh. Ooh. Uh. I saw you fought beside Jamandi that night. Oh, God granted you impressive power. Yes, I used to serve Erastel on the battlefield, but those days are long past. Now I call on his power to heal those who've fallen from a roof more often than anyone wounded by a sword. Of course, someone has to roam the forest and slay monsters, but I'm more useful to my congregation here, attending to more mundane affairs like hospitals, shelters, and charity affairs. <laughs> Do many people in Restov venerate a Rastel? They revere many gods in a Restov. They pray to Abadar, patron of cities, and Pharasma, gatherer of souls. There are also some more rare cults, but there's no denying that the Stag Lord has the largest congregation here. Sorry, the Stag God has the largest congregation here. And no wonder. People here have lived off farming and hunting for centuries. So, something I wanted to point out that I had forgotten from my previous attempt at recording this is that he's dressed in humble, plain attire, but has a large golden holy symbol of a rastal. Which definitely feels like more than an affectation. It might be a a greedy weakness of his that we can prey upon in some way. And used to our advantage. You know, he it's uh it's pride, it's avarice, right? It is wanting to show off a bit. You know, bringing law to the stolen lands is a difficult endeavour. I would be grateful for any help you could spare. I'm not talking about immediate help, I'm thinking more long-term gains here. Our most pious aspirations are often hindered, but it is not the case where overcoming such obstacles allow us to become closer to our God. I give you my blessing, and I believe you will be able to overcome these hardships and achieve your goals, so I'm not going to get any help from him. That's okay, though. It was an honor to meet you. Goodbye. And I still keep you. A good, devout man. I like him. And here we have Natala Sertova, the woman I was warned about. The woman who. Jamandi Aldori considers to be an enemy. Natala Sotova is discussing something with an unfamiliar old lady in a low voice. Upon noticing you, she breaks into a sugary, sweet smile. You were not only tough, but quick. Well, congratulations on your victory. Enjoy it while you can. Look, I'm not going to ask her if that's a threat. If that's a threat, I should be intelligent enough to realize it as one. If it's not a threat, I don't need to antagonize her. And also, if it is a threat, I don't need to tell her that I've realized it's a threat. And, uh, what do you think awaits me? Nothing good, I fear. The Aldori, our dearest friends, di didn't deem it necessary to inform you of their plans, I assume. You see, they're preparing to separate from Brevoy. It will not be a peaceful process. In other words, they're traitors. They lack the strength currently, hence using this legal loophole to create some independent allies. 
Once the civil war breaks out, your lands will be the first to endure a strike from Provoy's forces. Perhaps they'll erect a memorial stone in independent rest of to honour you. Well, I wouldn't count on even that, really. I believe Jamandi Aldori mentioned something similar about wanting to be an evil bitch slag traitor to the crown and betray her fellow countrymen, all in the interest of some kind of nasty thing. And at least her and her family weren't duped into signing some evil Maastricht treaty many years ago. They have no pathetic excuse for this unpatriotic behaviour. And it's just not on. That being said, the royal family has gone completely bonkers. And if we are acting as an independent, we can actually curtail this separatist nature of theirs by not acting in accordance with their plans. And uh, what would you propose then, my lady? In your situation, the most reasonable course of action would be align yourself with the lawful rulers of Bravoy, the noble houses. The Aldori won't dare to rebel, knowing they will immediately become entrapped. You would help Bravoy avoid a civil war while simultaneously enjoying some well-deserved peace in your lands. And much more well-deserved peace back in your lands, my lady. I believe Jamandi has already attempted to impose a guard on you as an emissary. I'm guessing her low-born stepson, the green-skinned boy, Kassil. It's up to you, of course, but I would recommend you a different envoy. Please meet Chandra Merve, an experienced diplomat who's far more familiar with Bravoy politics than any brawler could be. The old woman standing next to Natala gives you a slight bow. I would be happy to help you establish diplomatic relations with Bravoy. I'll consider your proposal. Think on it. Do not make any hasty decisions. Well, I have a nasty feeling that I told Lady Aldori that I would be accepting her son. And I gotta be careful about that. I honestly can't remember. And I do need to be careful because, you know, keep all the promises you can make and only make promises you can keep. I'm not sure I gave her my word on it. Um, I think I agreed to it tentatively. Let's come up here and meet these people. An older man with full sideburns looks at you with interest through a golden eyeglass. Well now, if it isn't the hero of the festivities, the protégé of our dear Germandi. You pulled this all off quite cleverly. I confess I wasn't convinced your enterprise would succeed. I've uh, even better a bottle of my best Pataxian wine against you. But I'm happy to admit I was wrong. The Aldori have always been adept at finding new talent. You know, I don't believe we've been introduced. Uh, so it would seem. I imagine him saying that in a tone that implies that he feels someone has let him down by not introducing him to me. Right? It's someone else's failing. I am Josef Salimius. Lord Mayor of Restov, I rule this land and the adjacent lands as your northern neighbour. I hope we can look forward to a long and fruitful friendship. So, this is interesting. This conversation option right here is the player character being an idiot and not understanding how a mayor operates under the nobility as a lower level of government. So, you rule Restov. And what about the Eldori, then? Don't they rule Restov? Ah, Bravois' politics must seem complex and incomprehensible to many. Not really. This is really basic. This is really simple. This is the writers saying, you're an idiot from modern times who doesn't understand how government used to work, and you need to be told lots and lots of information. 
here in this part of Rossland, the spirit of the Northern freedom still lives. We are loyal to the throne, of course. May the gods prolong the life of his highness, but here, far from the dominions of the great houses, we have our own way of life. It is especially important now, after the certain events that I probably don't need to name. The certain events would be every single member of the royal family disappearing overnight. But I'm not from here. I'm from the Five Kings Mountains. So what kind of events are you talking about? Mayor Salemius gives you a patronizing smile. Why an aspiring politician needs to be well informed. I'm talking, of course, about the disappearance of the ruling house Rogavia. Can you imagine it? Old man Coral conquered our land two centuries ago. It would be a shameless lie to say that nobody wished his royal house could just disappear into thin air. But once that exact thing happened, it turned out nobody was ready for it. Poof! All over the country, every member of the royal house disappeared without trace. Nobody knows what happened. It is a mystery, but a mystery pregnant with opportunity for everyone. Oh yes, chaos is a ladder. If you really want to look at it that way. And how are things doing in Restov? I don't want to boast, but things have been going well in recent years. Trade prospers, the population grows, and the citizens are happy. This again feels like an anti-monarchy, anti-royalty statement. Obviously this is his stance, but the writers have given us a very one-sided picture here. Uh, we've only come across maybe one person who is... I'm not talking about Natala Sotova, I'm talking about the other one, uh, Brelev or Drelev, over to the west. And um, they're giving us a very heavy-handed picture to say, look, we all want to be independent, you bastard, you have to agree with us because we say so. Although recently, especially after the disappearance of House Regavia, more and more troublemakers have been appearing. People are talking about the most shocking things, but those sorts of rumours aren't worthy of your attention. Well, it was nice meeting you. I'll say goodbye for now. Please, wait a moment. Your young barony will need resources to establish itself, and from what I've been told, you're somewhat in need of financial assistance. I could organise and supply everything you need for the construction, and spread out the cost on extremely favourable terms. I could immediately procure, let's say, 500 cartloads of building supplies. I'm sure that would give you a good start. In exchange, I would ask a small favour. Until you repay the debt in full, you simply assume the obligation of contracting building services through Restov's Builders Guild. Do we have a deal? Right, this is an exclusivity contract. It's a trap. Allow me to explain. The sweetener, the bait, is what I will presume is a large amount of building constructions, which would give us a good head start, let us, you know, kickstart our barony. However, it would be a loan to be repaid. During that repayment period, I would only be allowed to hire builders from Restov. Now, this means a few things. Yes, it strengthens the relations of Restov, right? It means Restov are good friends of ours. We get along well. That's good. It means that the people in Restov benefit from us. So, let's look at that back again. It's a bill, right? It's a debt. We take on the debt we pay him back the debt. While we are paying him the debt, we are also spending most of our money with his workmen. Essentially putting that money into the economy and increasing the wealth of his uh, portion of the countryside. So, 
we essentially pay him back twice. Like, we pay him something like double what we... I don't know. It depends how much we pay the builders, right? But essentially, all the money we are spending is going to him. And making him better and us poorer. Because we could be hiring workers from our own land, right? Giving people jobs, helping the economy, keeping the money in our region. Or from other neighbouring kingdoms who we also need to build relations with. So this is a trap. I thank you for your offer, but I simply must decline for now. It's your choice, of course. I just figured I'd mention it. Well, it was nice meeting you. I'll say goodbye and not accidentally click on the offer. The feeling is mutual, I assure you. I look forward to hearing more of your dazzling successes soon. So this is a trap. Now this young lander here, down here, is a trap in that he's unreliable. We can't rely on him to, to be around and do the jobs. And he will have his own interests as well, right? His own ties to the noble houses. Megarvan, to the west of us, He's a mercenary, a fighting man. He might look at our land with hungry eyes. He doesn't know how to conduct politics well, so he may get aggressive and nasty. Hannes Drelev, well, he thinks we don't deserve the land in the first place, and it should probably be his, so he sees no problem with taking from us what should not rightfully be ours. That being said, he actually is established, right? Megarvan, not established, brand new, just set up Kip. Hannes Drelev, he's got the infrastructure, right? He's got people we could trade with, we could build a relationship, and perhaps in time, if we have, you know, his, his family may come to respect ours over the generations. It's all about the long game, right? We live through our children. It is unfortunate we couldn't persuade, persuade the priest to give us some kind of help. Let's go speak to Jamandi Eldori now. So, how do you like our little gathering? I hope you've made some useful connections. Shall we move on to the official proceedings? I don't like the way you're jockeying for power here, and I have the option to do so as well. Before we begin, I'd like to talk about the envoy I'll be taking with me. My apprentice, Cassiel Eldori, will go with you, won't he? I think not. Chandra Mervey will be my envoy because she's the only one who's actually interested in traditional status social structure and maintaining the status quo. And if I want to be on peaceful terms with my neighbours, maintaining the status quo would be a good thing. Also, she's not a raging separatist, anti-monarchist, anti-royalist scum like you and probably Lander, who's not interested in being part of the nobility anyway. So yeah, Chandra Mauve will be my envoy. The emissary of House Sertova? Well, perhaps it's for the best. As they say, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. She's disappointed, but she understands. This is all about playing the political game. Also, I'm already on good terms with her. Strengthening that bond would be to my advantage, but keeping an eye on the Sertovas would also be good. Lander, I mean, he might come sneak in and steal some stuff at some point, who knows. I'm ready for the ceremony now. Excellent. Stand here. From this point onwards, I'm going to get really annoyed. Uh, NPCs in the game constantly use Your Grace as an honorific because the writers have been watching Game of Thrones. Your Grace is a religious honorific for bishops and the like. It's not a... Uh, what do you call it? With the S. Um, it's, it's not a noble honorific. You, you know, the, the word of S for not being religious. Oh, it, it slips my mind. Sorry. It, um... It's something like the word, it's like a, it's a bit like savoury, but it's not savoury, because savoury is to do with food. Right, well, don't call me your grace, because I'm not a bishop. Lord 
lords and ladies, today we are here to honor three brave people who have done the impossible. They've tamed the stolen lands. Baron Hannes Drelev, the new master of Glinnabon, Captain Mager Varn, the conqueror of Dunsward, and finally, the tamer of the Shrike Hills, who put an end to the atrocities of the Stag Lord's bandits. Step forward. That's Keldrak Morden to you. On behalf of the people of the free city of Restov, I confer upon you this noble title. Rise, your grace. Again, not a priest. It's going to continue for a good long while now, probably the rest of the game. All because some twat who can't even spell the word sir correctly mixes up his honorifics. And writes bad books for the idiots like. And then a massive TV series gets made of it so he never has to finish the books. Victory! The Stag Lord's dead! And the capital of the new barony has been built in place of his fort. That was how the long and challenging taming of the Stolen Lands began. Two things. Number one, that looks nothing like me. Number two, the sooner I click this, the sooner I have to not look at Lindsay and remember her horrible voice. Greetings, Baron. Ah, Keston Garess, I believe. I can't remember his voice. So, well, welcome, Your Grace. Keston salutes you. You can see he's a bit anxious, and it seems he's rehearsed his speech many times. Let me once again congratulate you on your victory and your new title. Lady Diamante transferred me here. I am at your disposal. I am not one to bestow honours, but I want you to know I'm glad to serve you. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of your new sit capital citizens. The Stag Lord's former stronghold will soon be a thriving city. The word travels fast and the first settlers have already arrived with new ones approaching as we speak. While you were visiting Restov, much has been done here. Your benefactors, the Aldori, invested a great deal of resources in rebuilding the city. I stand ready to answer your questions and show you around the most important sites. Well, then, where are my companions? They're all somewhere around here, but I never kept an eye on one on who went where exactly. Well, I assume Tristian is with Jod, and you can always find Lindsay. Just follow the noise and the turmoil. I'd rather not, if possible. Uh, what's the mood of the people here? I must admit, I've never seen anything like that my whole life. A city, a whole barony, born right in front of my eyes. And right in front of our eyes. The people sense for a moment, and today we're feeling proud. As a rule, I'm not too cheerful or chatty. I normally feel out of place among all the rejoicing, but today is just one of those days. Are there any citizens I should know about? Our old acquaintance Jod is right here. Erastil's clerics normally don't like cities much, but he's eager to serve you. Also, the emissary from Brevoy is here, waiting for you in the throne room. There's also this curious matter. An elf has paid us a visit. A blind elf. Desna only knows how he managed to get here. He seems a peaceful, even pleasant fellow, though naturally a little odd, if so... I let him stay a while. It's up to you to decide what to do with him now. That's about it, I suppose. Keston scratches his head. All right, I'm ready to look around the so-called city, which is probably more like a village. Lead the way. Follow me, your lordship. It is not a religious. Greetings, your lordship. We are well, your your new subjects. We're selecting a site to build our new house. 
It's wet, near the lake, and windy up here on the hill. A fine place to throw garbage at your neighbours' heads, though. Ow! Ooh. Oh. It's a good thing you got rid of those monsters and bandits, your lord, my lord. That'd be right more for a for a for a baron, my lord. Best. Do you recognise this place, my lord? This is where the Stag Lord's fortress wall used to be. Not that it saved him in the end, huh? Our workers did a fine job turning this bandit den into the heart of the town. Indeed, they do appear to have done so. The heart of every town is its main square. We plan to hold street festivities and fairs here. Look, we already have our first vendor. Indeed we do. I'll look forward to seeing his wares soon enough. And he bows. Greetings, my lord. If you turn to the right from the square, you'll end up straight in our tavern. I suppose that's where I'd find Amiri. Drunk off her face. The tavern's ale is blessed by Caden Kalian himself, I swear, and the lady who owns it is a gem. I should probably go meet her then, just say hello, and I like the statue. I heard her baron is tall as a troll, has air of pure gold, and can breathe fire. Well, that's nonsense. Well, apart from the part about breathing fire, all barons can breathe fire, trust me. I should glare at them. As she is a worshipper of Torag, I can breathe fire if I need to. But welcome, my lord. Glad to serve you. Man, our guards only have staves. My lord, those are our guards. They keep order in the city or keep their mouths shut. And there wasn't enough time to read that at all because this game is being horrible. Here's the observation platform. I hope one day your capital will grow large enough that we won't be able to see its full extent from this perch. I don't know if that will update, but it looks very Banner Saga. Or, um, something similar. And there's Harim there, enjoying the view. The building in front of us is your residence. That's where we'll head to now. Ah, oh, the Great Hall. Nice piece of work, if I do say so myself. Welcome to your barony. You are about to make the unyielding stolen lands a prosperous kingdom. This, there is a long and arduous road ahead of you. You and your advisors are going to deal with matters of national importance. Found and build up settlements, seize and develop new regions, solve pressing problems, and take advantage of good opportunities. In other words, things that normal adventuring heroes wouldn't have time or the energy to do. A prosperous governor will be handsomely rewarded with support and donations from their subjects, promising alliances with other states, wealth for their treasury, and many other things. Good luck with your ruling, Baron. So now we've reached the main chambers. This is the throne room where you'll hold court and receive visitors. Let me draw your attention to this large map depicting your barony and its surroundings. We'll mark all the important scout reports and other news worthy of your, my lord's attention. Having finished his speech, Keston tucks his thumbs under his belt and stands quietly. Not e as easy to do in playtime if the belt is too tight. And now I would have to remember what Chandra Mavay's voice was like. She was older. It's, uh, it is good to see you, your grace. Chandra Mavay, the emissary of Natala Sertova, greets you with a brief bow. Let's dispense with formalities and get straight to business. As emissary of the Royal House Sertova, I'm here to offer you advice and to make sure you don't do anything reckless. I hope my experience in diplomacy and policy will be of some aid as you make your first steps as a ruler of the barony. Barony effects, community plus six, loyalty plus six, military plus three, economy plus three, divine plus three, arcane plus three, stability plus three. New events. 
trade agreement with Sertova? As Vanke's offer. I turned that down. Pillage the Temple of the Elk, rebuild the Temple of the Elk, Ragongar's training, Harim's training, and Jafal's training. Difficulty level of the barony. You may change the difficulty level of your barony at any time or set it to automatic. I have not set it to automatic because I want to experience this. If set to automatic, you won't have to deal with most government decisions. They will be taken care of automatically and your barony will never fail. However, this will also prevent you from unlocking any governance related achievements. Understood. Remember, you should visit the capital personally at the beginning of each month. By tradition of Bravoy and most of the River Kingdoms, it is then that rulers address the day's most important issues and receive visitors. Today, you should choose candidates for the highest positions in the barony. It is not my place to offer my own thoughts on this. Perhaps, if I were a noble of greater standing and lineage, it would be your place to offer f such thoughts if asked. Your clerics, Jod and Tristian, were the first to ask for an audience. I shall leave you to your capable of judgment. Be wise, and your rule shall be long and fruitful. Your Grace, allow me to congratulate you on receiving the title of Baron. I am not confident that you will be able. I am confident that you will be able to bring order to these troubled lands. Judge smiles slightly. For well, to be honest, that isn't exactly what we wanted to speak to you about. Tristan and I have been talking a great deal about what happened at the Temple of the Elk. It doesn't at all make sense to us yet, but one thing is clear. There's a powerful curse at work. It corrupted the very essence of that sacred place, stepping it with putrescence. Ugh, I am disgusted with whoever could do this. Jod exhales loudly, catching his breath. <sighs> And now, there is a new woe. Tristian and I believe the curse did not simply disperse of its own accord. There is a place near the capital rumoured by the locals to be cursed. Tristian and I visited this dreadful place and we felt the same putrescence as at the Temple of the Elk. What is this place and where is it? There is a bald hilltop not far from here to the north of the capital. Its crown is entirely barren of life. The locals believe that rituals glorifying the dark gods were held here, there back in ancient times. There is no longer any trace of such rituals, but the air around the hilltop is heavy to the point of stifling. This place is like a rotting wound, closed but not healed. And this wound will undoubtedly open again. Tristian and I felt something approaching. Something ominous. The curse will soon return to plague us once more, I swear by Erastil. I should go there then as soon as I am able. I would be happy to accompany you, but I would not expect to see anything new there at present. I agree with Tristian. We have been to this hilltop. It's barren, but filled with a dense atmosphere of unease. Well then, what would you suggest? The curse will grow in strength, and we predict it will reach its peak, the peak of its strength, in about one month's time. That's when we should visit the bald hilltop, and that's when we should visit the bald hilltop and resolve this issue. For now, we can only wait and prepare. Yeah, you do that preparing. Also, maybe do some research. We beg your pardon, my lord, for intervening with you getting the grasp of your barony. I'm sure you have even more pressing matters at hand right now. Well, we'll soon see about that. Now that Keldrak Morden's the rule of his own land, and that's gone flashing by too quickly as well. 
The barony has, and another pop-up disappeared too quickly to read as well. The barony has ten basic stats, each supervised by an advisor. They are as follows. Population, Regent, Loyalty, Counselor, Military, General, Economy, Treasurer, Divine, High Priest, Relations, Grand Diplomat, Stability, the Warden, Magic, Magister, Culture, Curator, and Espionage, Minister. Stats increase if your governance is successful and decrease if events don't end well or other negative factors are placed in your way. Don't let your barony stats drop to zero or lower. This will cause your subjects to riot and your state will begin to crumble. Each stat has certain milestones or ranks within them. Every 20 points in a stat will increase your rank. Rank 1 unlocks a corresponding advisor position for that stat. Further development of the stat upgrades to its ranks. How further development of the stat and upgrades to its ranks will be possible only if you have an advisor in the relevant position. Governing your barony will require one advisor for each stat. You may appoint your companions as well as some of the stolen land citizens into these advisor positions. Each of the ten positions has at least three characters who are qualified to hold it. Not all of these characters will be willing to serve you right away. Some of them will need to be convinced. Appointing others will require completing an assignment for them or rendering them some other service. Every advisor acts on their own ideology. They have their own opinions on everything that happens in your domain. Therefore, you may want to select characters whose governance philosophy is consistent with your own. Open the Advisor tab on the right side of the screen, click an empty slot and select a character to appoint them as an advisor. Each barony stat gains a bonus from a specific ability of the appointed advisor. The exact size of the bonus is indicated in the upper right hand corner of the advisor's card. Only advisors may address the problems, opportunities and sudden events that occur in your domain and require immediate attention. Don't leave these positions vacant. Choose a name for your barony. The name of the barony cannot be changed later in the game. Well, I shouldn't call it the Stolen Lands. It needs a suitably dwarven name. There are ancient dwarven ruins in the Stolen Lands, especially in our portion of the Stolen Lands. Um... What do I want to call it? Something like Tirek Null, Zavil Kulam. Um, Karadin Volkasa. Ah, you know what? Let's go with an old stalwart. Gondamar. Yes. Now, click on your capital icon to open a settlement map. At the moment, I don't want to because I have to click the Advisors tab. And here we have positions, five positions. We have the Regent. Regent ensures subjects, complaints and concerns are heard by their ruler and serves as a link between the Baron and the people. Essentially, this is a steward, someone who looks after the place while we are away. The Councillor deals with troubles of the common folk and helps settle land disputes and agricultural matters. This advisor ensures citizens remain loyal to the throne, essentially a local governor. The General is the highest ranking officer in the army of the barony and is responsible for watching the borders and protecting the realm. Okay, makes sense. So we want someone responsible for that. The treasurer's duty is to keep the coffers of the barony full and ensure any gold is spent wisely. No candidates are available for this position. I see. No matter what deity he serves, the high priest strives to satisfy the spiritual needs of all citizens in the barony. Choose an advisor. Yes, okay, let's see what we've got here. 
Uh, we've got Keston Gares, who doesn't want to fulfill any role. I'd like him to be the warden, to be honest, looking after local security. I think he'd like that. He might also make a good general. I think we need to get on his good side. j isn't interested or isn't ready. Interestingly, our lady wants to be in this position and not this one. As does he. I'm not too confident about giving Octavia that job. Valerie, I'd be much more confident. I don't think putting Amiri in charge of the army would be a very good idea. Harim as High Priest, Jod as High Priest. Given that I want Harim to be able to go adventuring and Jod not so much, this might be a better option. Ah, uh, putting him in charge of the army, he's a horrible, horrible person. Lindsay gets no job, that's great. And this woman, who we don't even know who she is, gets no job. Right. Uh, even Stevens. Octavia always strives to solve problems peacefully. Valerie strives to follow the letter of the law. We are a lawful character. Octavia could be a bit of a yes man. You know, she could be a bit too much of an appeaser. Counselor. Uh, Tristian would do a much better, would do a better job of this than Chandra Mave, but we may need him to go adventuring. Chandra aims to make a profit while following the letter of the law. Uh, cares for the people overall. Yes, we'll put him in the job for now. Army. I mean, Amiri, because Ragonga, I'm not sure what's adding to this. Strength. Oh, if that's all. Okay. No one for this job. And for the high priest, is it wisdom? It's wisdom. Um, let's go with Jod purely because Harim might be busy doing other things. Alright, so let's go back to the map. Tuskdale. Uh, go for one region. Claim outskirts. Declare the outskirts a part of your kingdom. I'll look into that. Projects. Seven. J Files training. Please tell me it's only J Files. Oh god, no. Ooh, okay, okay, this could be tricky. Right. J Files training, intensive training expeditions into the wilderness, improve your companion's proficiency. This increases your companion's level, making them suitable. Okay. Harem's training. Rigongar's training? Apparently doesn't exist. Ah, oh, there it is. Rebuild the Temple of the Elk. Restore the Temple of the Elk to its former glory, making it the center for Erastal's worship in all the surrounding areas. Unlocks a special region upgrades. Prevent. Can I right click on this? Oh, I can. Awesome. Prevents pillaging the temple. That makes it so much easier to read and costs 100 build points in 60 days. That is a long term project. Pillage the Temple of the Elk. Plunder the Temple of the Elk and rob it of all remaining treasure. Plus 150 build points. Prevents future restoration of the temple. Yeah, I don't like that one. That's not going to be too popular for people. Um, as Vanki's offer, I ignored this offer. I do not want to take this deal. Is Vanki Keeg, High Priest of Erastal from Restov, had a strong interest in spreading the Stag God's faith across the region. He is eager to build a shrine dedicated to Erastal on your lands, but at his own expense. Accept his offer if you wish to gain a useful ally and a place of worship for Erastal. That is a good one, right? That I should consider. And trade agreement with Sertova. Our merchants will receive the right to establish a seizable, tr sizable trading post in the heart of New Stepfen. Each city in the barony gains an extra plus five build points per week, plus two build points for each town, and plus one build point for each village. Uh, 60 days, uh, yeah, it costs a lot of build points. This is a good project we should look into when we can afford it. Uh, so we have free training. Ooh, I can abandon. Um, wasn't there claim the outskirts? It would have to be 
of one of these two. If I do that, one of four days to solve, okay. I'll pop you in here. I need to I need to check what other things I might need them for. Let's enter. You may construct buildings to increase your barony stats. Each building has a cost in build points and a construction time. You may construct several buildings simultaneously. To start construction, select a building you need from the list on the right side of the screen and place it in an empty slot in the settlement. Buildings may provide special bonuses if you meet certain conditions. Most commonly, two buildings must stand close together to grant the bonus. Make sure you use this feature to your full benefit when planning a settlement. Some buildings can be placed only in designated spots or areas. As examples, a pier must be built on water, and a mill must be built with no other buildings around it. Demolish a building to get rid of it and recover half of resources you spent on construction. If you want to move a building, you will have to demolish the old one, gaining half resources you spent on it, and construct it in a new desired slot for half the price. You won't have to spend any extra build points, but you will have to wait for construction to finish in the new location. Now, looking at the build list, there are 1, 2, plus 9, so 9, 10, 11, 12 available building spaces, and 15 available buildings, of which the, the piers can only be placed here, the watchtower and the mill, where is it, uh, water mill, windmill can only be placed here, meaning that for now the mill and the watchtower are exclusive. I cannot have both. I don't know if growing this village to a town or a city will grant me additional building spots. The longhouse, um, a spacious building for holding meetings and discussions, um, can be upgraded to town hall if we build this to a town. Gondomar. This town is lawful, of Tuskdale is lawful good. Community, kingdom stat of 10, kingdom stat rank of 1. Loyalty 15, military. So, the low ones I need to look out for are culture, espionage, and relations. So I should be looking for things that will improve them. Right, barracks can possibly be upgraded to a castle. They tie in with the windmill, but I'm thinking windmill here. Uh, granary, what's that going to give me? Uh, give me community. So I'm thinking longhouse here, fortress here, granary here, marketplace here, shrine somewhere up there, herbalist down here, something like that, right? I obviously can't afford very much. So let's start with that granary and plonk it down here. I should probably not add too much just yet because I need build points for my other projects. Uh, the windmill would be a lot of points. The pier, uh, relatively cheap. Let's grab that as well then. There we go. You may claim new regions to expand your territory. Open the Regions tab on the right side of the screen and select the relevant project at the bottom of the screen. Claiming a region will allow you to significantly increase your barony stats and found settlements in the new lands. Here is what you must do to claim a new region. Meet specific regional conditions, that is, complete a quest or reach a certain rank in one of the stats collect sufficient build points of a claim, find an unoccupied advisor who can take charge of the claim. As soon as you start the Kingdom Project to claim a region, time will automatically speed up for the next 14 days, the time it takes for you and your advisor to claim the region. After the new territory is claimed and annexed into your domain, the boundaries of the state will change and you will receive all the bonuses granted 
by the claimed region. Okay. Well, hang on. If it's two weeks, how many build points are we getting per week? 32. Let's go back in. And build that longhouse. There we go. Training, yeah, 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 regions. Can't I do it myself? Okay, I can't. Oh, because claiming a region, I'm always involved in that. Uh, so obviously I want Tristian to do this. And after this claim is finished, I'll probably be rounding up the episode, to be honest, because I've been recording for plenty of time. Occupied for a lot of time. I should have done some training of companions during this time, shouldn't I? Oh, well. Declare the outskirts part of your kingdom. Your barony has expanded. It now includes the outskirts. Excellent. One of your barony stats has reached 20 points. It's time for you to increase its rank. First, meet with your advisor and discuss the future of the state. To do so, return to your capital and click the button on the appropriate event card in the throne room. Whatever choices you make, remember your advisors may disapprove. If the current advisor decides you that you argue too much, they will leave forever. After you talk to an advisor and make a decision, a new kingdom project will become available that will increase a stat rank. You can find it at the bottom centre of the screen on the Projects tab. It will take you and your advisor 14 days to complete the project. Time will be automatically sped up until the project is completed, which means we will be nearly at the end of the month and ready for the other thing. Uh, outskirts. Only one settlement can be founded in this region. Region for stone lands bordering with Bravoy. It is less monstrous. It has less monsters from the woods or marshes, but is plagued by numerous bandits. For a long time, Oleg Leverton's trading post has served as the only bastion of civilization in this inhospitable realm. Region upgrades are not yet available. You have not claimed any resources in this region yet, and I totally should. Whereas here... Yeah, 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 yeah. Which stat has gone up? Oh, is it loyalty? I think it is loyalty. Uh, I know who that would be. That would be our priest. Right. How's our building going? Uh, our granary is built. Yeah, all right. You need to talk to one of your advisors to address important matters of a barony. To do that, you have to close the barony management screen and get back to the throne room. Longhouse. Okay. Okay. Um... 274. Well, that's going to take a while to build yet. Um, we should, however, establish those barracks before I forget. Right. Now. Events. Councillor awaits. In, okay, yep. Enchanted wind. I mean, there's all these to deal with as well, right? Ah, uh, what's this? Enchanted wind. News has arrived of the largest observatory in the Five Kings Mountains. The enchanted lens of their main telescope broke. A discovery of such a powerful artifact caused a gust of wind of enchanted wind, which is now moving towards a region of the barony. You could, should seize this opportunity. Who can I send? Only Jod. Which advisor wants to see me? I don't know. It literally won't tell me. And it's going to take two weeks. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, let's, let's slip him in here, because I'm, I'm hoping it's not him. Uh, crisis points. I have crisis points. I can use those to make it easier. Okay. And now, oh, let's click. 
Who do I? Who wants to see me? Please don't be Jod. <laughs> Is something Christian? Yes. Oh, look at that regal slouch on the throne right there. Tristian lowers his head. A greetings, Baron. I am sorry to take you away from your away from your other affairs, but your people need you. When the stolen lands was freed from the stag lord, the people sighed in relief, but many are still confused by their swift change of fortune. If truth be told, they simply don't know what to think of their new baron, nor what to expect of you. Will you be a fair ruler for all, or only for those of wealth and status? Let us reassure your people. Show them where your tr favour truly rests. Perhaps a small celebration will help to win them over. Of course, you should spend the same amount on a luxurious dinner. A sort you could spend the same amount on a luxurious dinner for the wealthiest of your barony. But I recommend organising a fair for the common people. The ones upon whose shoulders your power truly resides. Uh, we should hold a fair for the common people. Um, a luxurious dinner party for merchants. Don't want to do anything. Make up your own mind. Uh... No, I'll, I'll agree with you. We should hold a fair for the common people. Um, we can... We can celebrate for nobles later. For now, getting the support of the common folk would be good. We should hold a fair for the common people. I want them to know that I hold them close to my heart. Tristian smiles warmly. We will hold a common celebration where everyone will be welcome, including the poor and downtrodden. This is the greatest gift a ruler can give to his people. Plus two community, plus two culture, and new events support the councillor's endeavours. Hopefully now... Oh, damn it! Another one! <laughs> Harim looks embarrassed. He runs his fingers through his beard and clears his throat a few times, then speaks at last. I heard, uh, not that it is important, but, uh, well, <coughs> he clears his throat again. I heard that an ancient trade road built by the dwarves of the Five Kings Mountains runs through these lands. I don't know what happened to them or where they went. Unforgiving time spares no one, but the road itself is still here, and possibly not only the road. Harim holds his beard in his fist. Well, Kilderak Morden, I have a request. If you find any dwarven ruins in the area, I would like to see them with my own eyes. And why, pray, do you ask this? Of course, Harim. If I find any dwarven ruins, I would allow one of my fellow stuns of earth and stone to come see them with me. I'll take you to them. Oh, thank you, Kilderak Morden. I will, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. I'm pretty sure we thank you. Harim left his homeland long ago, breaking all ties of his people, but it seems it's not so, and it's gone again. Jod Kavkin. My lord, my lord, I was at Oleg's trading post most recently, and I noticed old Bokken just standing there, bored to death with nothing to do. This is most unfortunate, after all. The old grumbler is a very knowledgeable alchemist. However, he has no use for his skills, since the locals need nothing more than the simplest of healing potions. And then it struck me. Why don't we hire him as your court alchemist? His decoctions and tinctures could certainly prove most useful to you. Also, it might be cheaper than simply buying from him or some other merchant. Yeah. Oh, we uh, to access the Barony's management screen, click on the table standing before the throne. However, we should probably also end the episode and save the game. Before Lindsay's cavorting drives me insane. Right, well, this is a good point to end it then. I hope you've all enjoyed this episode, and I do look forward to seeing you all in the next one. But I'm going to say bye-bye for now, and cheerio, everyone!